Welcome to episode six of Climate, Trees, and Legacy, video blog series that I began in January 1st of this year, 2014. Today's November 6, 2014, and episode six is titled Becoming Passenger Pigeon. Becoming Passenger Pigeon. I'm in Reston, Virginia, uh, just a commuting distance to Washington, D.C., where my husband Michael Dowd and I have been for the past 10 days or so. I'm wearing this t-shirt because this is the culmination, last Saturday, the culmination of the Great March for Climate Action, which has been the event that has structured the course that my husband and I have taken west-east across the country beginning March 1st in Southern California. The Great March for Climate Action is a group of people who walked some 3,000 miles. Only five of them walked every step of the way. Many others uh, walked quite a bit of the way, but also uh, volunteered for support action, uh, setting up camp, food preparation, cleanup, all that kind of thing. And then in many locations along the country, uh, there were people who walked just for a day in their particular city. So here in Washington, D.C. Uh, was the final, uh, November 1st was when they finally came into Washington, D.C. Uh, from Bethesda, and I walked the final six miles with them, videotaping their journey. You can look in the caption of this YouTube video uh, to see where you can find that video of the Great March for Climate Action culminating in Washington, DC. Moving on to the theme of episode six, Becoming Passenger Pigeon. Let's take a look at the main exhibit for the Passenger Pigeon exhibit that the Smithsonian Institution had this year. It's titled, Once There Were Billions, Vanishing Birds of North America. Now you might wonder, what do I mean by that title, Becoming Passenger Pigeon? Well, an obvious one is there's quite a few people, particularly younger people I'm meaning now, including those along the climate march, some of whom believe that given the way things are going in their lifetime and the future that they see ahead of them, not just economically, civilization-wise, but primarily environmentally, and that includes climate, um, that we, homo sapiens, may not be long for this earth. Now, as an older person, I don't happen to agree with that perspective. I think there's soon going to be quite fewer than 7 billion of us, but I don't think we're going to become extinct, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your view, given how many extinctions we've already caused and the likelihood that if civilization were to rise again and we'd forget the memory of what happened to us this time, that even more would go down on the next phase of the rise of civilization. But I don't mean that. And when I'm saying becoming passenger pigeon, I do not mean how we ourselves, numbering the billions now globally, are verging towards extinction. The passenger pigeon was not going extinct out of its own wrongdoing. It simply had not adapted to the hunting techniques that, that really clashed with their nesting style in the late 1800s. I'll talk more about the specifics of that later. But what I mean by becoming passenger pigeon is this. The passenger pigeon was one of the great dispersers of the nuts and seeds of our forest trees, especially here in eastern North America. Take a close look at what you see on this title picture in addition to the pigeon itself. That's an oak leaf. And those are acorns. And it's very important that they were put together here because what I mean by becoming passenger pigeon is that we humans are going to have to take over the ecological function of passenger pigeons now that they're extinct. It's thought that one of the major ecological functions they played was perhaps the most long distance rapid disperser of big seeded forest trees in eastern North America during previous times of warming and cooling and warming and cooling during the past five million years, especially the last three million years 
of the comings and goings of the various ice ages of the Pleistocene and then warming into the Holocene about 10,000 years ago, where we've been up until now. Now we're in the Anthropocene. Now we are in the age in which Homo sapiens, humans, are the ones uh, that are making the biggest impression on what the climate and ultimately the chemistry of the oceans and the rocks that are depositing will look like in millennia and millions of years to come. So the function that we have to play is to take over the role of dispersing the large seeded trees, forest trees, of eastern North America. Certainly the oaks with their acorns here I've got a couple examples of acorns that I've gathered with me recently here. So we're going to be have to playing this role. Also, hickory. Here's a hickory that I gathered recently. I don't have any examples of beech nuts, beech seeds. That's one of the major trees as well here in eastern North America, and the passenger pigeons certainly moved it. One that we're not going to be involved in, unfortunately, sadly, is the American chestnut. Now, this is a back crossing of American chestnut with Asian chestnut, so it's uh, no longer pure American chestnut. You will not find American chestnuts growing in American forests anymore. Uh, they went out in the 1930s owing to globalization are inadvertently bringing in a fungal disease or, or a vector um, that the Asian species of chestnuts are immune to. They've evolved to be able to coexist with that vector through time, but ours were just taken down by tremendously huge loss to our eastern forests. So this is something um, that's already vanished, but there's no reason, absolutely no reason, that we cannot step in and ensure that the acorns don't go down. We need to take over that ecological function. And that's what this particular program is about. So fasten your seatbelts. This is not a pleasant topic. Back to the exhibit at the Smithsonian and taking a look at how the passenger pigeon lived. The exhibit is on display um, this fall and through September of next year to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the actual bird you see here stuffed by taxidermy stuffed here on the left. You see three passenger pigeons there, two males on the right, and the one on the left is the very last passenger pigeon which once numbered somewhere between five and seven billion when my grandfather was born. That's Martha on the left. And she was collected live. She spent the last, I don't know, more than a dozen years of her life in the Cincinnati Zoo in Ohio. She had a couple companions up until about four years before her death. September 1st, 1914, that afternoon, she was found dead on the bottom of her cage, immediately shipped off to the Smithsonian here in Washington, D.C. in a 300-pound block of ice. Uh, where she was preserved, and even today her DNA is still accessible. But this is Martha. Take a close look at Martha. She's looking back at us. She's saying, hmm, what are you going to do now? You going to follow me into extinction? You going to take over my role? Are you going to be able to do as good a job as I could do? Are there going to be billions of you carrying seeds north as your climate moves? I mean, your climate is shifting far faster than climate ever shifted during my multi-million year species lifespan. How are you going to do it? That's the theme of this video blog. How are we going to do it? And let's get started. Let's first attend to a question you probably already have. How could a bird about the size of a pigeon that you now see in cities, which incidentally is an invasive brought in from Europe, um, how could that possibly swallow a seed as big as that of a white oak, a hickory, chestnut? How could this happen? 
Well, like snakes, the passenger pigeon had the ability to unlock its lower jaw from the upper, and so it could release it down and therefore swallow very large seeds. Now, how could it then become a seed disperser? I mean, first of all, it didn't have any teeth. How was it able to grind up? How could it get any energy out of something like this, which we have to grind in our teeth? Well, like chickens, passenger pigeons have gizzard. Any seed-eating bird, as opposed to a berry-eating or insectivorous bird, has a gizzard. They ingest stones and then they put the stones inside there and then it grinds. The gizzard moves and grinds up very hard nuts such as acorns and chestnuts and hickory nuts, even getting through that shell. Pretty amazing. But then you'd say, okay, well, how could they disperse a seed if when they poop something out, there isn't any live seed there anymore? Well, what happens is this is that there's a paired process with a major predator, or what would have been the major predator of the passenger pigeon, and that is the peregrine falcon. The passenger pigeon nested in large groups altogether, and I'll mention why it did that in a moment. But what it meant was when it was traveling from where it was gathering acorns that day and then flying maybe 10 or 20 miles to get back to its nestlings, where it had laid its eggs a couple weeks earlier and was now feeding a nestling, um, they traveled in large groups. And so the peregrine falcons, wherever the peregrines were along the way, could simply get up above, above the group of passenger pigeons, dive down, poof, take one out very easily, take it down to the ground, and eat the meat. So the acorns and the other nuts that had been ingested by the birds but had not yet been ground up by the gizzards uh, would have been viable. Uh, would have come out of the corpse, had next spring they would have uh, rooted and there goes a new tree perhaps 20 miles north of where its parent tree had been, maybe even longer. Now this is also helped by the fact that passenger pigeons as many other nut storing birds have is a very large throat pouch to it called a crop. And it basically can put a number of seeds into that crop and then fly back to its nesting area without those seeds actually entering the gizzard until after it got there. Let me read to you something written uh, from an earlier paper about what how many seeds were able to be held in that crop. It reads, a joint at the corners of the lower bill enabled their mouths to more than double in size. Their crops could hold up to a quarter of a pint of foodstuffs, and they could vomit at will if they saw food they liked better. Now, it's not vomiting from their stomach, their digestive juices the way we do. It's just expelling the seeds that they had in their storage pouch. Let's continue. Thoreau, a keen watcher of birds, marveled that they could swallow acorns whole. So just a, a quick look at the uh, nesting habits of the passenger pigeon and why they were so vulnerable from over the course of less than 50 years, uh, numbering in the billions to going extinct. And that is that they utilized a form of nesting called predator swamping. And that is that if you've got a lot of you, fish do this too when they school up, if they've got a lot of you, the likelihood that any predator is going to be able to get you as an individual versus all these thousands of others around you is pretty slim. So what they did is they would nest in large groups and both the male and the female and they both would feed the young, both the male and the female, the mom and the dad, would fly off as a group to wherever they had a good amount of acorns and beech nuts and hickory that day. In fact, they'd have scouts going to look as to where they should go for that day. So both parents would be gone and the babies would be unprotected. Now, the predators that were actually in that particular location, I mean, how many could they kill and feed to their own young in one day? Not that many. So peregrine falcons in particular, which are pigeon birds, that's what's, what they specialize in. They don't go after rabbits. They go after birds in flight. They would have been the major predator. 
Now, another thing that the passenger pigeon had going against it when humans came in is not just that they were all compressed, but what they had going against them was that uh, they put a lot of effort into raising a single young. They laid a single egg, they had a single young in each nest, and both parents would feed that single young using the lining of their crop that would be coming out through the night from their digestion into feeding what's called crop milk um, to their young before they flew off in the morning. Now the Native Americans, of course, also took advantage of finding and utilizing passenger pigeons, but they hadn't made a dent in them. And a big reason for that is Native Americans did not have two forms of technology that were available by the late 1800s. And that was a telegraph. You could communicate over hundreds of miles to say, hey, the pigeons are nesting here, come get them. And trains to be able to get there and more importantly, being able to salt, put into barrels, thousands and thousands of passenger pigeon carcasses and shipping them back east to New York City or very near to Chicago. A lot of the major nesting habitat happened around the Great Lakes area. In fact, being a sixth generation Michigander on my father's side, the Barlow family came over sixth generation. I guaranteed that even if my grandfather had not eaten passenger pigeons, certainly my great-grandfather did. So I am here in part because my ancestors did not starve. In fact, maybe they made a good living by hunting passenger pigeons. I cannot know their role for sure, but certainly they would have eaten some. So there we have all of us carry forward a surprising amount of guilt, a lot more than just those of us who had early pioneer ancestors invading the territories of the Native Americans in one way or another, causing them uh, great suffering and the near extinction and some extinction of tribes that have actually gone extinct. So there was a time when conservationists became very worried about the passenger pigeon. But by the time they did, they did not have the regulations, they did not have the field marshals to be able to really stop the hunting, even if the hunting was uh, prohibited in the nesting zones. And then nobody really understood that once a population uh, is reduced below a certain level, because it requires huge nesting population to be able to not be taken by all the predators, uh, the parents were not back there helping these birds, were not protecting the birds, were not camouflaging the birds. And so the last part probably taken out by our own um, hawk and falcon species. What remains of the passenger pigeon today? What remains besides a few skins and bones, precious skins and bones preserved in museums here in North America? Well, place names. You ever gone by something called Pigeon River? What about what hunters sometimes use in preparation for any bird hunting season, duck season, partridge season, grouse season? Sometimes they're out there shooting what's called clay pigeons or what they call trap shooting. All this was involved from uh, the time in which the passenger pigeon was still plentiful. Uh, they would be gathered up uh, shipped off alive in cages to places where hunters could then shoot them out of the air. Uh, they were released from the cages, they would fly, and so it was called pigeons or trap shooting. You would release them from the traps and there would go the pigeons and you'd shoot them. Uh, but the names continued. I remember when I was a little girl, I would go up north and I would see segments of strange looking round discs and my father told me, oh, those are clay pigeons, and we've been trap shooting. I had no idea what it meant then. It didn't look like a pigeon to me. Now I understand. That's the legacy we still have of our passenger pigeon. This episode is about the legacy that is thus far gone unnoticed. Even among ecologists, it is unnoticed that the passenger pigeon's loss means that our trees have not even kept up with the climate change that has gone on since the birth of the Industrial Revolution. And it's certainly not going to allow 
the trees to be able to keep up with the climate change that lies ahead of us. The loss of the passenger pigeon means that we must become pigeon. And that doesn't mean the scientists are going to be paid to be out there. Um, it means that we need to become pigeon. We need to use the maps and the projections made by the scientists themselves. And then we need to responsibly go out into the field and to become passenger pigeon. This next section will explain how. A piece of essential technical background to begin this journey into becoming passenger pigeon was offered in a 2013 professional paper by two foresters, Mary Williams and Cass Dumrose. It was then followed up in 2014 by a popular paper for the rest of us and especially for nurseries and landscapers, trying to involve them in the process of helping large seeded trees move north in this century of rapid climate change. The distinction they made is that there are three forms of assistance one can provide moving north with climate change. Three very different types and three very different scales of intervention with nature. Let's take a look at those three distinct forms of assisted migration. The first is what's called assisted population migration. And this is the least interventionist. All it means is that if you have a tree species that has a distribution range that has a, a pretty big north-south component to it, let's say you're the American beach where you're in Alabama and you go all the way up into Michigan, same species, American beach, very likely distinct physiologies. They look the same to us, but the tree itself has had millennia to adapt to the different locations it's now found in. And so to play safe, even though the beech trees will not be vanishing from Michigan owing to climate change anytime soon, perhaps not even this century, though that's questionable. At minimum, we can start moving up the genotypes, the seeds, from the more southern states where beaches are still reproducing and get those southern genotypes mixed into the northern populations. That's assisted population migration. The second form of assisted migration is what's called assisted range expansion. And this is basically where you are, in addition to what you're already doing with moving the genotypes north, you realize that the northernmost part of the range has now moved quite a bit ahead of where the trees are. And so you simply move poleward. You take some seeds from the northern part of the range and maybe reaching quite a ways down south as well and you move them as far north as you think they might be able to survive when they're germinating and growing but will still be in a climate amenable to them by the time they start reproducing 30 40 years from now. Could be huge shift in climate. So assisted range expansion here in the northern hemisphere to the north, poleward, is going to also be very important. The third form of assisted migration is called assisted species migration. And that's what my group has been involved with, oh, basically since 2004 when Terea Guardians first formed, to our eco-action in 2008 when we moved seedlings of the highly endangered Florida conifer tree, Terea taxifolia, into the mountains of western North Carolina. Now that was a very controversial action. It's less controversial now. It was legal. Um, here's a couple videos that you can watch if you want to learn more about that particular action. They're both found on YouTube. But what was unfortunate about all the press that we received at the time is that the other two less radical forms of assisted migration, that is assisted range migration and assisted population migration, had not yet really received any attention 
Even among foresters, it was just beginning, but it wasn't in the popular press. And so assisted migration, the term, became linked to entirely to what we did. And what we did was necessary for saving an endangered species that had been left behind in a peak glacial refuge while the other tree species had made it north. Now in their 2014 popular paper for landscapers and plant nurseries, Williams and Dumrose showed these three different forms of assisted migration in a very useful chart. Take a look at it. Here they give us an example of assisted population migration, western larch. You can see what's going on there. They're showing the states of Washington, Idaho, Montana, and then moving across into British Columbia, across the Canadian border. And this is what Canadian foresters are already doing. They are reaching down into the United States for their seed stock, and they are replenishing timber operations and fire devastated areas with seeds not drawn from British Columbia, but with seeds of more southerly adapted genotypes from down in the USA. That's assisted population migration. Assisted range expansion, again, this is the second type, this is a little more radical. They're showing ponderosa pine here. And again, what's going on is they are taking not only Canadian, British Columbia seed stock and some from the USA, but they realize that ponderosa pine has not kept pace with rapid climate change, especially since 1970. And so right now they're starting to plant timber operations and other areas in Canada with ponderosa pine, where ponderosa pine has not historically existed. So again, assisted range expansion moving poleward. Now let's take a look at the third form, and this is assisted species migration. And notice that this chart shown uses our species, Florida terrea, Terea taxifolia, that my group, Terea guardians, has been the innovator in. You'll notice that Terea's historic range is a Pleistocene relic population down in the panhandle of Florida, and various arrows pointing to the north. Here's an important section of the 2014 paper uh, by Mary Williams and Cass Dumrose. It's called, What is the Role of Nurseries? And they write, Nursery managers have an important role in the assisted migration process. It is unfortunate that most state and commercial nurseries in the United States have not yet explored how changes in climate will impact their operations. As part of the target plant concept, however, nursery managers should see themselves in partnerships with land managers, foresters, and restorationists and work together with stakeholders to provide appropriate plant materials, that is seed, nursery stock, or genetic material. The matching of existing plant materials with future ecosystems that will have different climate conditions is a formidable component of assisted migration. Foresters and nursery managers will need to rethink the selection, production, and outplanting of native trees in a dynamic context. Now, I first spoke about that actually before I saw this paper in episode four of the Climate Trees and Legacy series. That episode was on Arizona Cypress, and it was there that I drew one of the lessons that landscapers, professional landscapers and people who sell plants and plant nurseries can play a vital role just in terms of what they choose to stock and how they educate the public in doing so. That is, instead of just choosing the most beautiful Asian maple with the brightest fall colors, one can instead say, hey, what about taking this American sugar maple and let's move it a little bit north. Let's see if this physiology coming from a more southerly state will work in our state better. And in this way, you can be helping future generations Long after you're dead, this sugar maple, as it grows, may be able to withstand climate change in a way and help the species keep moving north as it produces seeds. What a wonderful thing for private citizens to be able to do as they landscape their properties, no longer just looking for what's beautiful for them, but thinking about 
how they can help species move north by their selection of seeds and seedlings. Keeping with how this topic of how landscapers, the professional landscaping business, can play a big role in assisting the migration of native eastern trees of North America northwards as climate moves this century as well. Keeping with this topic, I'm excited to announce that in September, the journal Landscape Architecture Magazine published what I now consider to be the best introduction to this issue of assisted species migration northward, given climate change, because it has a deep time perspective. That is, it begins with an understanding of conveying how climate change has happened in the past and how slow it has happened in the past, and therefore that assistance is needed and that we need not concern ourselves that any of these native species of American trees will become invasive or disruptive in any way as we move them north. The article was titled, Have Tree, Will Travel, and it was by Kevin Williams. The article conveys four stories. The first one is the futile attempt of the Nature Conservancy to restore America's iconic tree, Franklinia alatamaha, the Franklinia tree, back to its historical location, the very tiny, as it turns out, Pleistocene relic reserve where it was first discovered almost 200 years ago by the Bartrams. Now, as it turns out, the Nature Conservancy has property there, but the attempt to take this tree that has existed only in gardens and botanical properties, oh, very far to the north, Philadelphia to begin with, the attempt of the Nature Conservancy to move it back to its historically native range has failed. And from my perspective, obviously that's because of climate change has already made it uh, intractable down there, just as the Pleistocene Relic Reserve in Florida of Terea taxifolia has become unwelcoming for this conifer tree. So that was the first story. The second story was the story of our Terea Guardian's effort to move Terea taxifolia north. And one of the things I'm very pleased about in that article is that it emphasizes that our effort now is not only being successful in that the trees are not succumbing to the kinds of diseases that are taking them out in Florida, but we're learning a lot. We're learning a lot by beginning the experimentation well ahead of the professional conservationists and the scientists. Kevin Williams interviewed me for this article. I'd like to read you what he quoted. He wrote, for Connie Barlow, a science writer and founder of the group Terea Guardians, the future of the species lies elsewhere. Quote, why is everybody still focusing on trying to get this tree to survive in a peak ice age refuge when we're not in a peak ice age, she says. Obviously, it's been left behind. Let's get with the program and help it move back into the mountains, unquote. The Terea Guardians have been attempting to do just that with experimental plannings leading toward an eventual rewilding in the Southern Appalachians. He continues, the planning experiments seem to be going well and the Terea Guardians are slowly learning how best to propagate the species. Quote, for the first couple of crops, we just didn't know how to handle them. Now we're learning quite a bit more and we're getting quite a bit of success, Barlow says. On its website, the group posts results and observations from its planting experiments with rewilded terea. Among its speculations is that beneficial soil fungi in the Appalachian forests may help the species overcome the challenges it faces in Florida. The third story was about the U.S. Forest Service and the foresters in Canada about how this need to move trees northward this century as climate shifts is really not a frightening thing. The foresters have been doing this for quite a few decades and moving seed stock to wherever it can best grow is something that the foresters are accustomed to doing. 
The fourth and final story in this pivotal article, Have Tree Will Travel, talks about the role that urban foresters can play in moving native trees northward. Just one week ago, the New York Times published a very significant op-ed by two people who come from opposite ends of the spectrum in conservation. Emma Maris is a science journalist. She's written for Nature Journal. She's written a book called Rambunctious Garden, and there was a section in there on the work of Terea Guardians. Her co-author is Greg Applett, senior scientist at the Wilderness Society. The title of their op-ed is How to Mend the Conservation Divide. Now, the conservation divide has been growing, and the assisted migration controversy is a big part of that. And the question is, to what extent can nature be left to simply run its own course? Have we already affected Earth so much that just leaving nature alone is going to cause problems in itself? Now, obviously, those of us engaged in assisted migration, particularly at the scale I've engaged with, um, say, yeah, nature is already altered too much by us. We've got to take action. These are the new conservationists. Now, what's come to be called the old conservationists, the old conservationist worldview, and I still have a foot in that realm, is typified by wilderness advocates. That is the long-standing view that what we need to do is set aside large chunks of land and hands off keep out of it. No mining, no timbering, um, no manipulation of any kind whatsoever, except perhaps forest fire fighting. So the fact that these two, a new conservationist and an old conservationist, could come together and co-author an op-ed piece on bridging the conservation divide is in itself a crucial development in helping to move forward the assisted migration actions. I'll read a few paragraphs now from this op-ed, and while I'm doing so, I'm going to show some footage that I took just about 10 days ago on the same pilgrimage I made to the Smithsonian Museum to see the exhibit on the passenger pigeons. There happened to be a special exhibit commemorating the 50th year after passage of the 1964 Wilderness Act in America. New conservationists have been shaking up the field, proposing new approaches that break taboos, moving species to new ranges in advance of climate change, intervening in designated wilderness areas, using non-native species as functional stand-ins for those that have become extinct, and embracing novel ecosystems that spring up in humanized landscapes. Some old conservationists have reacted angrily to this, preferring to keep the focus on protecting wilderness and performing classical restoration that keeps ecosystems as they were hundreds of years ago. Editorials, essays, and books have been lobbed back and forth. Feathers have been ruffled, and conservation groups and government officials have felt pressure from both sides. The truth is, despite the disagreements, both groups love nature and want to protect it. These seemingly competing alternatives are really complementary parts of the smartest strategy. We should try everything. Skipping to the middle of their op-ed, they write, So what should we do? Should we continue to invest in keeping ecosystems in historical configurations? Should we attempt to engineer landscapes to be resilient to tomorrow's conditions? Or should we just let nature adapt on its own? They conclude, we should do all three. In the face of great uncertainty, the sensible thing to do is hedge our bets and allocate large swaths of landscape to all three approaches, restoration, innovation, and hands-off observation restoration, innovation, and hands-off observation. Now the innovation part, of course, that's what our assisted migration is working within that realm. Hands-off observation is wilderness areas. In future episodes of Climate 
trees, and legacy. I'll attend to the specifics of oaks and some of the other hardwood species of eastern North America. But for here, I just really want to emphasize three primary lessons for us. The first is that it's crucial to distinguish between three forms of assisted migration. There's assisted population migration, assisted range expansion, and assisted species migration. The second lesson is that the passenger pigeon, a vital sea disperser, is gone. And that brings us to lesson three, that we therefore need to become passenger pigeon. We need to become pigeon in serving all three forms of assisted migration now required of us. We must do this for every large seeded tree species that once depended on the pigeon carriers, their partners, during past warmings and coolings of climate here in North America. More than 50 years ago, the great conservationist of the early part of the 20th century, Aldo Leopold, spoke these words. We need to begin thinking like a mountain, he said. Thinking like a mountain. Over that time scale, over that duration, over that sense of ecological interconnectedness and the irreversibility of some actions. Well, now we also need to begin yearning like an oak. Let's step into the oak sense of what's needed today now that the passenger pigeon is gone, so we shall become pigeon. I'm going to end this episode by embedding a video that I made 11 years ago on my first pilgrimage to a site mourning the loss of the passenger pigeon. This is a pigeon monument at Wyalusing State Park in southwestern Wisconsin. And this is where Aldo Leopold delivered his essay later published in a Sand County Al Almanac. Uh, the essay is called On a Monument to a Pigeon. So here I am, 11 years younger, Wyalusing State Park. Aldo Leopold came here on May 11, 1947, to the mouth of the Wisconsin River, where it comes into the Mississippi River. And he was here to dedicate this plaque on a monument to a pigeon, dedicated a full 50 years after the great pigeon flocks once flew over this section of Wisconsin and much of the Midwest. We're here now in August 26, 2003, some 56 years after uh, Aldo Leopold was here on the Monument to Pigeon, reading from his book, A Sand County Almanac, published a year after his death. Aldo Leopold died a year after he, he dedicated this plaque, died in a prairie fire. This book is still turning souls. Sand County Almanac, this on a Monument to a Pigeon is one of his great sections of essays. Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. This is his essay, section of his essay, on a monument to the pigeon. This was his speech that he gave at this park, at this place right here, at the dedication of this plaque, placed in Wyalusing State Park, Wisconsin, by the Wisconsin Society for Ornithology, dedicated May 11, 1947. on a monument to the pigeon. We have erected a monument to commemorate the funeral of the species. It symbolizes our sorrow. We grieve because no living man will see again 
the onrushing phalanx of victorious birds, sweeping a path for spring across the March skies, chasing the defeated winter from all the woods and prairies of Wisconsin. Men still live who, in their youth, remembered pigeons. Trees still live who, in their youth, were shaken by a living wind. But a decade hence, only the oldest oaks will remember. And at long last, only the hills will know. There will always be pigeons in books and in museums. But these are effigies and images, dead to all hardships and to all delights. Book pigeons cannot dive out of a cloud to make the deer run for cover, or clap their wings in thunderous applause of massed, laden woods. Book pigeons cannot breakfast on new-mown wheat in Minnesota and dine on blueberries in Canada. They know no urge of seasons. They feel no kiss of sun, no lash of wind and weather. They live forever by not living at all. Our grandfathers were less well-housed, well-fed, well-clothed than we are. The strivings by which they bettered their lot are also those which deprived us of pigeons. Perhaps we now grieve because we are not sure in our hearts that we have gained by the exchange. The gadgets of industry bring us more comforts than the pigeons did. But do they add as much glory to the spring? It is a century now since Darwin gave us the first glimpse of the origin of species. We know now what was unknown to all the preceding caravan of generations, that humans are only fellow voyagers with other creatures in the odyssey of evolution. This new knowledge should have given us by this time a sense of kinship with fellow creatures, a wish to live and let live, a sense of wonder over the magnitude and duration of the biotic enterprise. Above all, we should, in the century since Darwin, have come to know that man, while now captain of the adventuring ship, is hardly the sole object of his quest, and that his prior assumptions to this effect arose from the simple necessity of whistling in the dark. These things, I say, should have come to us. I fear they have not come to many. For one species to mourn the death of another is a new thing under the sun. The crow magnet who slew the last mammoth thought only of stakes. The sportsman who shot the last pigeon thought only of his prowess. The sailor who clubbed the last auk thought of nothing at all. But we who have lost our pigeons mourn the loss. Had the funeral been ours, the pigeons would hardly 